five, four, three, two, one. Hello, my name is Linda Gale Becker. I'm from the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the University of Cape Town. It's my pleasure today to present um, this on long acting injectables for HIV prevention. From the earliest of time, women have sought ways to prevent unintended pregnancies, but it was only with the birth of the oral pill that reliable birth control actually arrived. And then we started to see that women could plan their lives uh, and the levels of fertility have come down uh, consistently over this period. So contraceptive choice has been very critical uh, to this development. We learn other lessons from reproductive health, particularly that long acting reversible contraception has become very popular with women. Uh, particularly amongst younger populations, such that we see uh, much better outcomes even in the most youthful populations when they are offered um, choice for contraception and particularly long-acting reversible choice. Now let's reflect for a moment on the AIDS epidemic. We reached our 40th mark. Um, the world has reached its eight billion person mark, um, but we also have seen 84 million people infected in the last 40 years, and uh, most recently, almost 5,000 infections every day. This is, according to the latest UNAIDS uh, report, way off track in terms of bringing the epidemic under control. Now, up until now, the notion has been that if we reached um, a level of treatment in the world, the models would show that we could then um, really impact prevention because um, undetectable viral load means people are rendered uninfectious uh, and thereby we could then get secondary uh, prevention and control. We know, however, that we have not reached these treatment levels yet across the world. And in 2020, we reached, um, instead of the 90, 90, 90, 84, 73, 66. So there are still around about 9 million people around the world to find, start and suppress. And we've seen unequal gains across the world. Um, and of course, we are now punting more than just 90, 90, 90, but really to try and uh, get to a point where we leave no one behind. At this point, of course, the Eastern Europe, Central Asia region is being left behind. So when we look at the distribution of new HIV infections by population, uh, we look at rates of, of mortality, uh, then this region is still in great trouble. And of course, the recent war in Ukraine is having an an ongoing impact. The last two years have also had a profound impact on our ability to reach those goals. Um, and this has had an impact not only on HIV, but on many aspects of public health. So there is no doubt that the treatment pool also requires a prevention push if we are to reach a point where we see uh, a real reduction in new infections. Luckily, to aid this, prevention has improved as well in the last 40 years. So um, in order to get effective epidemic control, we are going to need primary prevention that is effective. And the good news is that has significantly improved. In cities and regions where both treatment and prevention have come together effectively, we are beginning to see those reductions in infections. But we know that too many countries have failed to put in place the combination of structural, behavioral and biomedical approaches to HIV prevention focused on those at greatest risk to have maximum impact. So what else can be done about this? Well, we have new targets for 2025, and this includes uh, reducing inequalities um, with really reducing both stigma as well as ensuring that people are able to access good prevention services 
um, in a comprehensive, integrated way that considers sexual reproductive health uh, at large. So I am pleased to say that our prevention train is adding carriages almost um, annually. Uh, an important carriage is this one of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And now we have really a, an, an array of pre-exposure prophylaxis that is being developed. So the notion people not living with HIV are able to access pre-exposure prophylaxis of an ARV-based type, uh, which they take ahead of exposure to prevent HIV acquisition. And we now know we have oral FTDF, oral FTAF, uh, a combination of uh, F emtricitabine with either tenofova or TAF in a event-driven way of the 2-1-1 regimen. We have the depivirine vaginal ring, which is monthly. And of course, now we have cabotegravir long acting, which is two monthly. And we'll discuss these in a little more detail. So we have known now for a long time that a single pill a day of these two antiviral agents is able to prevent HIV. In those who are vaginally exposed, it needs to be daily. Uh, there is more forgiveness in people who are exposed via the anal mucosa. These results have been out since 2010. We've had FDA approval since 2012 and WHO on board since 2015. To date, over 3.3 million people have accessed PrEP, but we know that this rollout has been hopelessly slow. Uh, the rollout has largely been driven by Kenya, South Africa, and the United States, and there's much work to be done in reaching the PrEP targets that are before us. Um, really, uh, the as I say in the graph on the right, showing how Eastern and Southern Africa has made the biggest contribution, um, but a great deal of work to be done in Asia in Latin America, um, and of course, the Middle East, as well as Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, and again, you see the PrEP targets uh, by region. What about PrEP deployment per incidence? Uh, again, this is very unequal across the world, reflecting lack of commitment to prevention, ideology getting in the way of science, insufficient demand creation, insufficient investment, systemic lack of access, and of course, pricing. So there is a real need to equalize these efforts. We know for the individual, PrEP impacts lives. So for the first time, people are saying they are in control of their sexuality, their sexual lives. But daily oral PrEP isn't feasible for everyone. The, these are issues around stigma, around the fact that uh, pills are associated with uh, HIV and antivirals. Um, and for this reason, a lot of people are unable to take a PrEP daily. And we know when we uh, map out the PrEP journey of individuals, there are both enablers, but also huge barriers um, so that the need for daily use can be a barrier to early use persistence and lead to PrEP pauses and discontinuation. The challenge of adherence is very real, of course, particularly for people who are young. So here, the search study conducted in East Africa showing that those aged 15 to 24 really struggled uh, with daily PrEP. And these two studies, one amongst MSM in the US uh, and amongst heterosexual adolescents in South Africa, again showing good uptake initially, but then really struggling over time to maintain a daily regimen. We also know there's a challenge of persistence. People struggle to stay uh, in a daily regimen. Um, and here, again, two populations, young women and girls on the left, transgender and MSM on the right, showing that really the fall off after an initial enthusiasm is quite profound. So one solution may be less frequent and alternative dosing. So longer acting agents introducing, as I say, PrEP choice. And we again can gain lessons from other areas of medicine. Here, psychiatry shows us that when both oral and long-acting injectable formulations are available, then the adherence to antipsychotics are much improved. Uh, also, early detection of non-adherence is possible 
uh, whereas oral non-adherence can go undetected for a long time. If somebody doesn't come back for their injection, uh, you are immediately uh, alerted to this. And in these studies, um, adherence and persistence in people dealing with severe mental health disorders was much improved with long-acting uh, antipsychotics. So here's the first of our choice, the dipivirine vaginal ring. It is uh, inserted monthly. It's been shown in two studies to have modest efficacy, but when rolled out in an open label uh, way, this efficacy was much improved, such that now it is um, uh, approved by the EMA, uh, recommended by the WHO as a second line, approved in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and a number of uh, other countries in Africa for use. And again, young women may choose rather to use a vaginal ring that is only needed to be replaced monthly. The vaginal ring also opens the opportunity for other multi-purpose technologies. And so this really is uh, to alert you to the fact that these technologies are in uh, development at the moment. The combination of contraception with HIV prevention, STI prevention with HIV prevention, uh, opening up now, uh, through either oral uh, pills or uh, vaginal rings. And here you see the pipeline as it stands today, um, very rich in terms of the vaginal ring. And you can go to this uh, website, MPTS 101, to see uh, how this uh, development is going if, if you are interested. The first uh, MPT is now under trial. Um, it is the dual prevention pill. It will combine um, a 28-day co-formulated tablet of FTDF uh, and oral contraception. And so this study has got off the ground uh, and we look forward to seeing the result. Of course, we can also combine different kinds of um, uh, interventions. So oral PrEP with uh, doxycycline STI PEP or doxypep now shown to be um, a, a, a real intervention. Uh, and this is a way to manage both STIs, chlamydia trachoma, as, as well as HIV prevention. Now, what about an injectable? And here you see that uh, young people feeling excited about a, a two monthly, but even wishing it was longer than two monthly, and we'll come back to that. But here is cabotegravir long-acting. So shown in 083 amongst men who have sex with men and transgender women uh, to have a significant reduction compared to oral PrEP. And in 084, the spectacular results of an 89% reduction in HIV acquisition amongst young women in Africa compared to oral PrEP. Um, so this actually is now approved in South Africa, in Australia, in Zimbabwe, uh, and um, uh, in the US. And it was shown uh, to be superior to oral PrEP because of this problem. So also here you see, although young women, young men start well with their oral PrEP in the, in the uh, comparator arm, over time, adherence falls off. What do we still have to understand by cap with cabotegravir long-acting? Well, we have been worried about the very long tail, but it turns out that actually where some of the concern now lies is in being absolutely sure that people are indeed HIV negative when they start the long-acting injection. The reason here is if they are in a seroconversion phase of acute infection, the injection may mask the infection, covering up the fact that they actually have become infected. Um, and this has led the FDA to approve cabotegravir long-acting for prevention, but only uh, when used with um, antigen testing as the screen uh, for HIV status. So this does add a level of complexity to have an antigen test. Uh, the label that has come through here for us in South Africa is not requiring that. Of course, we will uh, wait to see what other countries do. 
Um, but this is a significant piece of work uh, that I think falls into implementation science that is required with Cabotegravo long-acting. The other component, of course, of Cabalet is how much is it going to cost? And here's a modeling study out of South Africa showing that really, unless it is no more than twofold the cost of oral prep, it is not going to be cost effective. It certainly won't be affordable. Um, so that is one aspect. Uh, there are other modeling studies that suggest that the local dynamics are very important. Reductions in HIV are likely be, to be driven by uptake and sustained use rather than how efficacious the agent is. Um, and again, this modeling study to show that unless we take the intervention to scale, we aren't going to see the impact over time. So it's really important that that price comes down and that access is realized and we can take uh, the agent to, uh, to scale across the world. So the price point, absolutely key. You can see now four countries around the world have approved this. Uh, Vive Healthcare, the developer, has um, handed the license over to the MPP Medicines Patent Pool, and we are going to have to see what that does to price. I will just draw your attention to this now quite old modeling study done by Rochelle Walensky as, uh, as old as 2016, where she makes the point that oral daily prep should be expanded and optimized, um, and that Oral uh, long-acting prep will be very cost-effective, but may require novel financing mechanisms uh, because there is going to be a price gap uh, to begin with. So um, I think you know a crystal ball early on to show us what probably is going to need to happen here: donor funding to enable the rollout of this agent. And this is my very simple model, which shows that we've got to bring costs down in order to get coverage up. And it's only when coverage is up that we begin to see scale up and then impact. What about other innovations in the pipeline? Uh, well, let's first turn to uh, long-acting injectables. Um, before I do that, I do want to just point out that is Latravir. Uh, was very much on all of our minds, the monthly pill. Unfortunately, these uh, studies have been put on hold because of an unexpected adverse event uh, related to a drop in lymphocyte count. So we will not be seeing monthly as latrivy, and these studies uh, have been drawn uh, to an end. Luckily, it is not entirely off the, the, the cards yet that is Latravir may be developed for uh, the implant. It is continuing as a treatment pill in a lower concentration. Um, and so let's uh, hope that the implant uh, may still come forward. There are other implants underway. Uh, TAF implant uh, and Cabotegrava both going into implants for the future. But let's come back to Lenacapavir, the six monthly injectable. Um, this is an antiretroviral for prevention that will only have to be taken twice a year. It is also being developed for treatment. Um, as I say, six monthly, it's given subcutaneous. So there is a possibility of self-administration. It has a very high resistance barrier. It's a novel mechanism of action. It's a capsid inhibitor. Uh, the question will be what to pair it with for treatment, but obviously very important as a single drug agent for prevention. Studies are already underway. Phase threes here, you see the design of the phase three woman study. It has two primary endpoints. The comparator arm is FTDF and FTAF. So we'll be able to see whether FTAF is possible in women. This has not yet been proven. Um, and here the, the counterfactual is the background HIV incidence. So an interesting design uh, that the FDA has allowed. Uh, similar kind of uh, design in the men and transgender men, transgender women, and gender non-binary study. Uh, the combination here, FTDF with a background endpoint uh, of um, just HIV incidence. Uh, let's now look at broadly neutralizing antibodies. This is another very important aspect uh, in development underway. The first BNAB shown to have a PrEP type indication has been VRCO1. 
These are broadly neutralizing antibodies infused as um, as a as a solution, um, and this uh, importantly showing proof of concept that uh, what was important though, because we did not see overall efficacy, was because the uh, circulating HIV viruses were not 100% sensitive to VRCO1. Only 30% of circulating strains were susceptible and thereby giving a lower overall efficacy. But when sensitive, we saw very impressive um, uh, defense against HIV acquisition. So the concept has allowed ongoing development. There are a range of different kinds of neutralizing antibodies out there that have been discovered. And these are now being developed in uh, combination to broaden the sensitivity. Uh, they are uh, going into the field, into trials now in combo. So you can see these combination clinical trials moving forward. And you can look at the AVAC website for more details there. The BNABs vary by breadth and potency. Um, and I think this is an exciting field. Let me end up by saying uh, this does, however, question how we deliver PrEP though. Wonderful, we're having choice in the, in, in the kinds of uh, interventions or commodities we can put forward, but it also requires us to think about access and how we deliver. So this raises differentiated service delivery or as WHO has now called it differentiated prevention delivery. And that really speaks to how PrEP is delivered. So the when, the where, the who, and the what. How, can we give longer prep refills? Can we decentralize out of clinics to, close to closer to home? Can we support this through peers? Um, and can we offer this uh, in a variety of different ways? Um, and it allows us also to think about client-centered packages, a package for young women, a package for commercial sex workers, a package for transgender individuals, and a variety of delivery models and distribution points. And when we've gone into the field to talk to young women, they've said, what about pharmacies? What about mobiles? What about door to door? What are some of the other things we can do? And we are now rolling out a large scale uh, prep project in Cape Town, accessing 25,000 young people for prep through a variety of uh, hub and spokes type approaches, including couriered prep, mobile clinics, local clinics, schools, uh, prep depots uh, in hairdressing salons and so on to really see if we can uh, get prep out to people much like you would get fast food out to people. We call it fast prep. We also need to move forward in our paradigm. So beyond uh, you know, the medicalized form of prevention through harm reduction to real affirmation and well-being, saying to people, PrEP should be about uh, pleasure, uh, getting back to owning sexuality and getting back to uh, really speaking to people's well-being and health. So prevention should be accessible, affordable, easy, discreet, guilt-free, enhancing, and never distracting. And it's very, uh, very happy to see there are projects now such as the Pleasure Project, really wanting to put um, pleasure back into uh, sexuality um, and move away from the fear mongering that HIV created. But this will require us as healthcare providers to rethink uh, how we think about this, really uh, bring equality, but also bring differentiation and rekindle our empathy as healthcare workers uh, to, to empower people to um, self-care uh, and really want to obtain the best prevention for themselves. And here, the power of peers is not to be underestimated. Um, you know, really, I think Southeast Asia, Central uh, and Southern Asia showing huge inroads into how uh, peers can bring services to individuals who are particularly marginalized. This slide I've adapted from Nit my good friend Nitya Panupak in Thailand, who has really mapped out these various kinds of prep 
and said, you know, what are some of their benefits? What are some of their difficulties? But what you can see is there's work to be done in understanding how best to optimize these uh, various agents. But also we now have uh, different characteristics that we can map to individuals according to their preference. And we believe, similar to contraception, that when we offer choice, we'll have better uptake, better persistence, better coverage, and better impact, um, as was shown in this wonderful study uh, called contraceptive choice. So it feeds into pre preferences, prevention preferences. Um, and it says, when we do that, this may, uh, adherence and, and persistence may improve. And we've already seen uh, some outcomes in this regard. So this is a study called NTN034 amongst young women in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, where they were offered a choice of the oral PrEP and vaginal ring. And you can see that they were, first of all, able to make the choice. Secondly, when given choice, both compliance and persistence and adherence all improved. So, you know, this gives us hope that this is where we need to go. So over the next five years, I believe treatment efforts will escalate, but getting to all the people who need antiretroviral treatment is going to get harder as we get along the last mile. So we will need ongoing effective prevention. We will see increases in oral PrEP use, particularly if we differentiate the services we provide. We will see the introduction introduction of choice, but I think this is going to be somewhat slow. It's going to depend on the cost of a long-acting PrEP and how quickly we can roll this out and gain access to as many populations as possible. Um, of course, the standard of care is also evolving as this happens, which will have an impact on how we uh, test new products coming down the line, for example, the BNABs. We will also get a better sense of market share and population preferences as we start to see choice coming through. Um, and of course, just to remind everyone that options must include pregnant women and those who are lactating. Um, and a gap will remain for a less frequently dosed pill. It's been sad to see the end of Islatrovir, but we hope something else will replace that uh, development soon. So here are the three change makers, choice, preference and access. And if we can cover those three, then I think we can expect better coverage of all people and better coverage of all exposures, which will lead to impact ultimately. And with that, I just thank you all for your time uh, and your, uh, your attendance. Um, and I wish you well.